Coming up on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. Because he wanted to detect you know, some no- anomaly situation. First of all, he find a normal situation where those positively or negatively correlated metrics. After the finding, monitor it. If something happened, if one of the metrics go up along with other metrics, doesn't do that. In this case, go down. Or actually go up all the way. That means that's an anomaly. In the Internet of Things, there are generally three classes of analytics performed. Real-time analytics done on the fly, alerting you to anomalies. Predictive analytics performed as a post-process, yielding a prediction and a confidence level. And descriptive analytics that reports on the past, present, or future data with visualizations that often result in the biggest insights. In this episode of the IoT Business Show, I discuss the differences in these types of analyses with Shepard Shi, as well as the steps that are taken before and after. All this and more on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. The people, the business, and the technology of the next generation internet. This is the IoT Inc. Business Show. And now, here's your host, Bruce Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the IoT Inc. Business Show. This show is made possible by sales of my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, and the IoT Inc. Certified IoT Professional, or ICIP, online training and certification program. Become a certified IoT professional by completing the program's three courses, ICIP Technology, ICIP Business, and ICIP Strategy and Digital Transformation. Details of which can be found at www.iot-inc.com. That's www.iot-inc.com. With me today on episode 24 is Shepard Shi. Shepard is an IBM Distinguished Engineer leading the Internet of Things Analytics Project. He has over 25 years of experience in high-performance software development, and in addition to IoT analytics, He's involved in IT operational performance analytics and predictive analytics for inventory and warehouse management. Shepard, welcome. Oh, thank you very much, Ruth. So you didn't mention this, but you're also an IBM master inventor. What exactly is that? (laughs) Yeah, uh, again, when I show people my business card, right, people ask that question too, right? Uh, Yeah. This is, again, in IBM, right? So basically, uh, the company encouraged the uh, 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 engineers, all the employees, right? Basically, Mm -hmm. uh, file patent applications, right? Oh, okay, Uh, okay. uh, Again, I have like, um, I don't know how many, 40 or 50 patents already, right? So basically, (laughs) all the projects I work on, I have those uh, patents, right? Ah, so so you you patent everything you work on, and because of that, you're a master at you're a master at patenting, and I guess you're a master <laughs> inventor then. Right? I guess they have a criteria, right? But at this at my stage, basically, my main responsibility to help the young developers, right, to right, basically right. identify some potential patent ideas, right, and actually going through the patent application process. Oh, very good. Okay, well, I think this is our first master inventor. I'm uh, I'm kind of uh, excited to get this thing going. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background in IoT? Okay, sounds good. Right. So, uh, again, I was from Taiwan originally, right? So, you hear mm-hmm. my accent might be like, kind of unique, right? I was born in Taiwan, mm-hmm. right, and come to the United States for graduate school, right? Okay. I've been in the state for about 30 years, uh, but my accent is a combination of Taiwanese, Chinese, and a bit of Texan, right? So, <laughs> Texan, okay. <laughs> I have conference call all the time, right? I can tell people can recognize my voice very easily because that's kind of unique. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you've been in Texas for, for 30 years, or has it been different parts? Yeah, I've been, uh, again, I got my master from Stanford University, then I got my PhD from University of Illinois and Champaign-Urbana. After that, basically, I'm in Texas for, I think, about more than 25 years now. Wow, wow, wow. So now, what's something people don't know about you? Is there, what can you share with us? Uh, I'm going this way. I've been known as the problem solver in IBM. Okay. Right. All right. Okay. So during my whole career, right, I actually even my first assignment, right, because I was a DB2 architect, right. Um, mm-hmm. uh, again, 
uh, typical when people have problems, right, to solve, right, will come to me or I say, Shepard, right, this is your job to fix it, or actually figure out a solution, right. And, of course, during the first half of my career, right, basically I worked on a number of projects, right, mm-hmm. and all, all related to performance, Right. Oh, okay. uh, because mm-hmm. typically when people have problem with the product, right, and they seeing that service up in typically in two categories. One is quality, right? Another area yep. is performance, right? They have right, right. poor performance for a large enterprise customers, right? And of course a lot of them are related to the database, right? That's my background mm-hmm. thing. So oh, that's okay. the first half of my career. Right. The second half of my career basically focused on developing a tool to help people diagnose right, and solve problems. Right. Okay. That's again related to IoT analytics, right? Later on you can see there's again uh well talk about performance analytics in one aspect and IoT analytics they are very much similar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well better a problem solver than a problem maker, I guess. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> At least I understand. I know how to solve problems, right? And I need to make sure the tools are easy enough for people to solve the problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. So where are you seeing most IoT analytics being used uh being being used for today? Yeah, again, when I see again I started involved with the IoT analytics about three, four years ago, right? So, so RT being real time analytics, you mean? Now, at that time, we actually looked at, because one of the products I work on is asset management product, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, again, a lot of customer, worldwide customers are interested in knowing, right, for the data I have collected in the asset management database, right? And can they actually use those information to do predicted maintenance? That's where okay. I'm starting from. Okay. Okay. So mm-hmm. basically, uh, you look at the different category of analytics that fall into the predicted analytics space, right? Mm-hmm. And in that space, you can see, right, for for the data to collect it, you need to actually find the right statistics model, right, to really to do prediction, right? Uh, typically, is it involves some really. Um, I call, uh, in our term, right, we call data scientists, right? So people mm-hmm, actually have sure. a statistics background, right? Look at the data that we have, the pattern of the data, and figure out what is the right algorithm that can be applied to it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So when you have to hear about IoT analytics, right, then you can, you, you might hear actually uh, some people will talk about like predictive maintenance, right, or predictive asset management, right. They sure. also classify as part of IoT analytics. So, so, stati- so building the statistic, mo- the statistical model, mm-hmm. uh, that's interesting. I want to get into that just a little bit. So now is this actually, what type of model is it? Is it? What type of model is it, I guess? Yeah. <laughs> this is, again, uh, if you look at the, the input data, right, then typically mm-hmm. there's a distribution, data distribution of the input data, right? And specifically, they actually have normal distribution, right? And they have, uh, there are different kinds of data distribution, right? So okay. based on the mm-hmm. data distribution, you need to take a look at what kind of prediction you would like to see happen, right? Because different uh, data input or uh, different data pattern, they are actually corresponding algorithms can map to it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, okay. Uh, it's, um, I don't, and it, again, maybe it's not, it should actually do a little bit of advertising because IBM, actually, we have SPSS of our, it's our flagship product for this monitoring. Right. We actually make use of mostly the models actually in SPSS. Okay. Okay. And now the statistical models, just just for my understanding, mm-hmm. are these what are these functional models? Are these um, uh, stochastic models? Are these implicit models? What type of models are they? Uh, typically, they are actually are statistics driven, right? So, for example, I just give you an example, right? So again, this yeah. is uh, the algorithm we have been using, right, for. Uh, part of performance analytics, we find that it's also, also applicable, right, for some of the mm. IoT asset analytics. Okay. Okay. There is an algorithm called Granger causality model. Okay. Right? So if you look actually look for Go Google, you can actually find right the, the definition of Granger causality. Okay. Okay. So what happened is there are, for example, when you diagnose this problem, there are a lot of we call the metrics, right? Or actually in IoT world, basically there are data uh, actually got delivered or sent in through the sensors. Sure. Okay. So from the performance world, there are metrics, right? Performance metrics, mm-hmm. application performance metrics, or uh, CPU memory usage. Those are all metrics from uh, from the performance diagnostic perspective. Okay. okay. 
and you have large number of metrics coming in, right? Uh, but what other metrics are related? What other metrics are not related? Okay. Mm, mm. Uh, or I should put it this way, right? Uh, typically, there is a pattern, right, and of those metrics. All right. Uh, I use, let me use some performance management kind of a cut, uh, pattern Actually, maybe people can understand. For example, mm-hmm. when the workload actually increase, right, your CPU utilization increase, mm-hmm. right, and your memory usage increase, mm-hmm. right, and of course, uh, the, those things that are, are, we call positively correlated together. Okay, I understand. So they're correlated. When one goes up, the other one goes up. Right. So it's called positive mm-hmm. correlation, not negative correlation, because something okay. go up, and again, another, another one, one goes, goes down, down, right? But mm-hmm. these things actually, granted, actually, we will we'll be able to identify the correlation between metrics. Gotcha, okay? gotcha. In this case, if something happened abnormally, because typically we look at either for performance or IoT analytics, they're the same. We are looking for anomaly, mm-hmm. because we right. want to find out what went wrong. Right, right, right. And because you want to detect you know, some no- anomaly situations, right? For example, Granger in this case, right? They, first of all, he find a normal situation where those positively or negatively correlated metrics. Okay. Mm-hmm. After the finding, to monitor it. If something happened, if one of the metrics go, for example, you should go up along with other metrics, it doesn't do that. In this case, go down. Or actually go up right. all the way. That means that's an anomaly. Ah, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so, so there that's... are actually a lot of other algorithms in this category, but Granger actually fall into the time series kind of correlation, right? Uh, that's the one that actually we will find it actually useful, right, in a lot of situations. Yeah. Now, is this something that can be done in real time, or is this something that has to be done kind of as a post-process? Yeah, you got a, a good point. And typically, those kind of analysis are computation-intensive, Right. Mm. Uh, again, those mm. algorithms are typically run in the background, right? Uh, after you collect the okay. data, you can do the analysis. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. And so uh, then it's like a batch process. Then. It's a batch processing. Yeah. So you mentioned about the use cases for IoT, right? So mm. again, yeah. the interesting part is that you can see, you know, in the IoT world, a lot of use cases are in fall into the category of real-time analytics. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. So that's a really the interesting part, right? Because and again, there are actually what we call predictive part, right? And a lot of statistical algorithms associated with it, right? And of course, there are really, uh, I say, really a large portion of the use cases fall into what we call the real time analytics. And now, what's the basis then for the for the analytics mathematically? Is is it still a statistical model, or is that now since it's being done in real time, it's something a little bit more simple? Yeah, like you said, it has to be simple enough so that you can respond in real time. Mm, okay. mm. Uh, so if you look at some of the, uh, again, this, those are technologies, right? And right. there are technologies today, basically, do we, do we call real-time analytics engines, right? Yep. So mm-hmm. uh, there's one that's called Spark stream, Streaming, right? Mm-hmm. And actually, Spark is the kind of analytics engine IBM actually are endorsing, right? Within that yeah. is called sparse streaming. Is the real time analytics part? Got it. Got it. And there are storms, uh, Apache storms, right? Of course, they, these are like, in the open source industry. These are the actually very popular uh, real time analytics engines. And what are they? So again, what are, what Spark and Storm? What are the? Uh, I mean, for the predictive or uh, for the predictive analytics or for the the trending? I guess looking for anomalies. You were saying you're you're building you're building these matrices and you're looking for positive or negative correlations. What is the basis or what's the general basis for, for the more real-time analytics engines? Yeah. See, real-time analytics is a little bit different, right? You can see both uh, Spark and Storm, basically, uh, they are in basically try to parallelize, right, uh, mm-hmm. the, the data so that you can basically process a large amount of data, right, Concurrently, right, for example, you would find, try to find, even for simple rule processing, right, you want to mm-hmm. find, for example, the temperature have exceeded maybe 50, 60 degrees, right, so the right. simple one, right? But you might have a large amount of volume of information going through. It's more than just temperature. Maybe you have air pressure, right, or uh, later we'll talk about some use cases, right, all kinds mm-hmm. of different mm-hmm. methods coming in, right? Okay. So the real-time analytics engine basically provide the programmers like us, right, the capability mm-hmm. to parallelize uh, the processing of those independent events, or some of them are related, right? You need to actually okay. put them together. 
Okay, so they're pretty simple. They're pretty simple comparisons, let's say, but where the power comes is what you're saying is in how they parallelize it. It's not so much the. It's not so much that they're working on complex models or complex equations to compare things. They're pretty simple, but what they're doing, what what is more difficult is the parallelization of this process. And again, can be start from simple, right? So that's the underlying platform or capability they are providing, right? Okay. Uh, and again, on top of that, uh, basically, uh, in, in my term, I call it a rules engine, right? Because you have you to have the ability to specify the rules so you can detect the anomalies. Okay, right. right. That's where the, the fun parts, right? Uh, on top of those real-time analytics engines, right, then basically the implementation needs to be put on top, right, allow the user to specify rule from simple to com- complex rules. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, mm-hmm. So later on, and again, uh, this is, the, again, a very interesting area, which it, we, my team actually working on the real-time analytics project. That's where really the, the fun part is, right? And when you actually have simple to complex rules, right, how do you, uh, because the simplest way, for example, you have one million of sensor data, right? You have a yep. hundred metrics or a hundred rules, right? Mm-hmm. You can process every single piece of the the, mat, uh, the the sensor data or metrics with every single rule. You have a hundred million computation. Right, 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 right. right. But you see, that's very resource intensive, right? Also, you want to get back things in real time. You don't want things to back up, right? So how do you process large volume of data efficiently is really, uh, I put it this way, we're working with research team. They have five patents in this area. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is really the, really the, the, the fun part of the, the, the project. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Well we'll, well, we'll probably jump into this a little bit later, but why don't we start at the beginning? So mm-hmm. at a high level for our audience, can you describe what are the steps in doing analytics? What are the general, you know, the general big steps that, we're, that we go through? Okay, sounds good. I think first thing is to connect, right? Or some people would collect the data, right? Depends on whether uh, you want to do real time or uh, predictive, right? Because predictive okay. typically people do it in the background, right? So you need to collect the data, right? For real time analytics, then you have to connect to with the sensor. That means the data source, mm-hmm. yep. right? Okay. After you get connect to the data source, you actually or I can get hold of the data, right? And uh, typically, in the real-time case, right, is the uh, I see the problem is simpler, right, because the data actually stands through the sensor as kind of more uniform format, mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. But for the predictive analytics case, there are data cleansing need to be done, right, because uh, sometimes it depends on how the data get collected, right, and the data quality is not very good, right. That right, we run into right. all the time for predictive analytics, right. We look at the data. Of course, we have the mechanism to collect data, but the data being collected is sometimes not what we're looking for. So data quality is really important, right, for both real-time predictive analytics. So you're cleaning up the data for step yeah, two more Yeah, we need to clean up the data, right, make sure the data either in the right format or actually have the right frequency. For example, right, later on we are talking about predictive analytics, right, mm-hmm. and for time series data, there are, for example, the Granger algorithm that we talk about uh, fit into the time series data. But the prereq for using Granger algorithm, you have to have data into in fixed time series, a fixed time period. Okay. Six, okay. Yeah. yeah, so that means you have to, the data coming in, you cannot be rendered, right? When, with, for time A, you come up with one data, time B, come up with another one, then it doesn't fit with this model. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay, so data quality, as I said, is very important, right? Okay. So after you actually get the data in, right, and then you need to analyze, right? So uh, analyze data. So typically we look at, um, uh, uh, I call it really three categories of analytics, right? Real time, that means we need to process data real time and respond, right? If mm-hmm. there are anomaly yep. situation, we detect it right away and let the user know, hey, there's something uh, was not right, you need to react quickly, okay? Right, right. Uh, and predict analytics, right? That means we need to analyze the, the data that has been collected, right? And also uh, actually tell the user, right, it might be there are some anomaly it can be detected through all the historical data that has been collected. Also, mm-hmm. also tell the user, right, actually give the user upfront warning that might be some potential problem might happen for your equipment, right, for your asset, right, or it may be for some of the IoT things, right, it might happen. So this is actually where the predicted algorithm actually fit in. 
Okay. Okay. So, uh, just so that user can react before the proactive react to those potential problems. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, I give you some use cases, right? So, so you were saying, but but um, Shepard, you were saying there were three: the real time one, and we talked about this. This is you know the simple rule. This is the rules engine, mm-hmm. the predictive one. We talked about the the analysis for that, and that was the statistical modeling. Um, did you not say there were three, or is there just two? Oh uh, yeah, there's there? three, right? So again, another one is actually very useful when I look at when we work with the customers, right? Those are really. Uh, a big part of it actually fall into this category. We typically call it descriptive, descriptive analytics. Descriptive, okay. Yeah, it, descriptive means after, because a, people sometimes classify as reporting, right? That means ah, okay. get the data in, right? Visualize the data so that people can get sense out of it. Because cons- consolidate, integrating data from different data sources, put them together. Visualize right. the data. Some, actually, in a lot of cases, then the people get really the biggest question answers through the visualization of the data. So, in the in so the output of descriptive analytics is going to be some visualization. The output of a real time analytics and predictive analytics is going to be so the real time analytics will be, I guess, some sort of a signal that that uh, that notifies you of an anomaly. And predictive analytics would be a report that would identify identify the anomaly or identify, I guess, would make a prediction based on the anomaly or, or I guess there's no necessarily anomaly involved in the predictive. So what are the outputs for the real-time and the predictive then? Yeah, see, uh, the real-time, like I mentioned, right, is the alerts. We typically alerts, right? right? Also, okay. in the actual implementation, right, we, we allow the system to trigger different type of alerts, right? Email is one of them. Right, mm-hmm. maybe yep. a text message. Right, uh, uh, maybe actually alert. They actually can generate. Uh, we call it a ticket. Right, ticket is the mm-hmm. uh, well work order. Right, to to repair sure. something. Right, so okay. those are the mm-hmm. action can be triggered by the anomaly. Okay. Okay. So uh, that's typical one. Right, for predictive. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, for descriptive analytics, and typically, will people look at reports? Okay. Okay. And with course, nice graphs and visualizations. Right, and right. You can see the visualization become well, actually reporting become the really critical part of the descriptive analytics. Right. Okay. And what about predictive then? Predictive is the the result of the model, right? So uh, there are a number of things that people are looking at, right, for prediction, right? So uh, because there is the current historical data, right? For example, there's a current mm-hmm. trend, right? And mm-hmm. there's a prediction. Prediction that means um, in the next let's say two to four weeks, right, what will be the trend of the data, right? Right, right. Uh, And based on that, it can give you a confidence level because, you know, prediction doesn't guarantee the prediction is 100% correct, okay? Because based on the data you provide, right, he can actually tell you for this algorithm, the confidence level for the prediction is about 85%. That means 85% Mm -hmm. might be right. Okay, another Mm -hmm. 15%. 15% 15% it might not be right, right? So that's another indicator actually it will be generated by the predictive algorithm typically. Okay, so you're saying the predictive algorithm then will say, um, this is what we're seeing, you know, this is the trend that we're seeing, and we believe, and this trend is, let's say, oh, the part's going to break down or something's going to overheat, and we have a and we have a confidence level of X percent. Yeah, that's that more right. Or less Based on the data we're getting, right? So that's what we get. Uh, that's how confident we can actually say this prediction data will be correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So step one, connect or collect, depending if it's um, you know being done in the background or real time. Step step two, um, what we're doing is we are either we're either doing nothing with the data if it's real time, or we're cleaning it up if if necessary if it's more on a post processing. Step three was the analysis of it. Sometimes there's being visualization. Is that more or less it, or is there, is there any other steps? Of course, the last step is action, right? And, action. Yeah, so okay. based on the result of the, uh, the analysis, what action that people want to take, yeah. Okay, so then they get the output that we talked about, whether that's an alert of some form, whether that's a report or a graph of some form, or whether that's a trend with a confidence level, then they take this information and it's either algorithmically um, and you know, there's a closed loop and some action is, occurs or it's interpreted by a human and then they take some human-like action. Exactly, yeah? exactly, yeah. 
Of okay. course, for the predicted part, right, the step is even more, right, because, like I said, we predicted uh, are very sensitive to the data patterns, right? So mm. in the predicted analytics area, right, typically in analytics kind of a step, well, there are iteration, right, to basically pick a model, right, verify the model, right, and with mm-hmm. the real data, may come back with another iteration to go through after a few rounds, maybe uh, eventually settle down with particular statistic modeling that applicable to the, the data, right, data pattern. Yep, 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 makes sense. Now, you're going to be in, as you collect more and more data, effective what you're doing is you're getting a more and more accurate um, predictive model or statistical model, right? Yeah, so this is an iterated process, right? So, again, uh, we, we typically for predicted algorithms, they always verify the accuracy of the prediction, right, or the results, mm-hmm. right, with the, mm-hmm. the real data, yeah. So let's move on. Let's move on to the classes of analytics. So, so our listeners are now, you know, they're getting an idea of, of generally how analytics are working. What are the what are the classes of problems, or what are the classes of analytics that companies can apply uh, to their data? Yeah. Uh, so the uh, there are a number of of I call it the classes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so in the predictive kind of uh, uh, analytics world, right, the predictive maintenance is the big class, right? So okay. yep. people mm-hmm. have heavy assets, right? So have heavy machinery. It's very expensive to uh, really uh, to repair the machine, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. also maintenance is the big part of it. Right, so because sure. you periodically you want to maintain the machine, right, but you want do want to actually do too much because every single maintenance is very is an expensive task. Okay, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. how do you actually get the uh, based on the data you are getting right from the machine and decide when will be a good time to service the machine or service the mm-hmm. the, the, the the equipment, right, mm-hmm. and also mm-hmm. how frequently you want to service it. And if there are potential problems might happen down the road, because if something fell, right, it's going to be a disaster for an uh, enterprise, right? Right, so, right. Uh, that's predicting, I mean, that's fitting pretty well, right? So, hey, they can predict, right, maybe this machine, maybe in the next two, because based on the data I collect, right, in the next two or four weeks might have a, uh, a fatal value, right? This, this will actually help the, really the, the company to actually uh, grasp those problems proactively. Yeah, no, I think that's interesting because generally when you hear about predictive maintenance, you don't hear about the second part. So, mm-hmm. so there's predictive maintenance, and it's saying, okay, we're predicting that something's going to happen. That that you hear about, but what you're illuminating, which I think is interesting, is you're also saying then the second part of that is how you're going to deal with it. And it's not like you just 100% fix it necessarily. It's a matter of how much energy or how much effort or how much money you're going to put into it to to prevent this, you know, to prevent this problem in the future, but prevent it in a way that's cost effective. I think that's what you're saying. Yep, that's right. That's right. Exactly. Yep. Okay. All right. So predictive maintenance. So what are some other classes? So this is, again, the first part, right? So, of course, uh, in the real-time world, right, there are a lot Mm. of use cases that we are uh, dealing with uh, these days and according to the IoT analytics, right? Uh, The big area is the connected vehicle. Right. Uh, typically, okay. these days, I think all the major automobile manufacturers are interested in, right? Yeah. Uh, basically, putting sensor in their cars, right, to sense the temperature, right. Also, some of the engine running conditions, right. There are actually different parts of the sensor that the manufacturer put into the automobile, right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Also, actually, people are looking at, right, how you know. Uh, how do you actually? If there are actually a uh, very dangerous situation. Right, and and how do you react uh, in real time to tell the car to take some actions? Okay, right. Uh, maybe mm-hmm. actually there, uh, there are some of the use cases. Right, um, uh, there are very slippery roads. Right, uh, during the day there are actually accidents happening in that area already. Right, mm-hmm. so we actually when the vehicle actually drive into that area because of the analysis of the previous incident happening. Interesting, right? interesting. And mm-hmm. also some of the sensor data actually receiving right from the sensor, basically, he might actually tell the driver you need to probably take some cautious actions right during this uh, uh, when he actually drive into that area. 
Yeah, that's a very yeah, that's a very cool use case because, you know, for years obviously cars have had anti slip or, you know, or traction control. But then what you're saying is you're overlaying another layer of data on top of that, which is the historical data based on geographic location. Yep. See yeah, in that's the cool. real time analytics world, right, this is again, uh we call it geofencing. Right, so mm, basically mm. allow, for example, I want to detect some anomaly situations within this region, right? Right, And right. I need to have the ability to specify on the map, right? This is the area I want the, the basically real-time analytics engine to focus on, right? So right, right. again, of course, that's the, 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 the product we are developing now, right? Basically allow the user to specify the, the really the geographical uh, kind of a scope, right, that they want mm. the tools to be applied to. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Uh, of course, actually, I'll give you an interesting example, right? This is the yeah. uh, interesting, see, very interesting one, right? So I just got that back from China, right? Uh, last week, right? So, and again, my my team had working with different customers, right? One of the customers is is a farm customers, right? And basically, okay. are raising pigs. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. <laughs> I hear about this. So, hey, oh, interesting, farming, right? right. <laughs> uh, you know what happened is, right? You know, they are actually are really big farms, right? They actually have they basically raise pigs, and also after get mature to a certain level, right? The uh, female need to be paired with the male pigs, right, to actually have okay. the next generation. Okay? Making bacon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's. It's for every pig, right? So they are thinking about, the customer is thinking about, because the, the movement of the pig is important because different stages of the pig, right, need to put into a different room, type of room. So they actually oh. make sure that actually grows, right, uh, have the very the maximum growth, okay? Mm-hmm. So what they do is they actually put sensors on every pig. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So what type of the, sensors are they? <laughs> so you know, uh, first of all, I know it, it, it used to be they actually put mark on the pig, right? But you okay, know, the yeah. pig actually scrapes themselves right on the mud, right? So it disappear very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> what they do is they put a sensor on every pig, right? So now they were located, right? They also know their movement, right? Because typically they can tell from the movement of the pig to understand what is the maturity level. Mm. Right. Maybe it's a time for them to move from one location to another because they have large mm. farmhouses, right, for pigs right. at a different level. Right. Interesting. And Interesting. also at a certain stage, they can tell from the movement of the pig to tell, hey, this is the time they need to pair the female pig with the, the male pig. Right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. I never, or I say, I know we actually deal with the uh, those heavy assets all the time, right? So this, this is an interesting kind of scenario. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. It is very interesting. Yeah, because of the volume of the pigs are raising, right? So because it again ensure that every pig get uh, well taken care of, right, is uh, very important. Yeah. Now, now there's got to be so many pigs. How are they going to find that pig? I mean, or do they have them on a smartphone like map or something where they know where the pig is? <laughs> I mean, there's so many pigs. They go, okay, I have to move pig number two thousand and sixty-five to, you know, this other location. How do they find that pig? <laughs> you can see that's where the sensor had to fit in, right? So okay, they, out, okay. they actually put in sensor on every pig, right? And also for uh, basically they have, sen- uh, they have gateway to know where each pig is located. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, so they do. Wow. Used to be it's not possible because the, the because it's cost, right? Because every sensor yeah. has to cost a lot. These days, the, the really the expense of the sensor reduced quite a bit. Right to yeah. basically make this one actually possible, you can see that's where why IoT analytics actually IoT the whole industry right uh, get a lot of attention these days because there are more and more business opportunities generated because of the the, the low cost sensors. Yeah, 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 no, for sure. Are there any other are there any other uh, use cases you want to share with us? Oh, I have a lot, but again, I look, I look at the time because it looks like the time is running out, right? But again, yeah. this is the fun part of it because the IoT analytics is really close to every, everybody's life, right? So a lot of things that we are dealing with, right, daily, like washers and drivers, refrigerators, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. all mm-hmm. in the IoT analytics world, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, Shepard. Well, well, more. Where can people find out more about you and uh, and IBM and the work that you're doing in in IoT analytics? 
Uh, you mean, what is the question, uh, Bruce? Where can people find out more about you and what <laughs> IBM is Where? doing in analytics? Yeah, uh, yeah okay. I don't have my, 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 my professional uh, Facebook yet, but I, mean, I will establish one actually down the road. Uh, but again, if people can send me email, right, SSHI at USIBM.com. People are interested in knowing more about IoT analytics, they send email to me. Okay. Okay. And um, is there a place on the on the web that we can find uh, more about your work or the the work that you're doing at IBM? And, and yeah, I didn't spend time too much time on that one. Maybe I should actually do something like that in the future. Yeah. Well. All right. No problem. Well, then what we'll do is is um, post. I'll I'll contact you and we'll find a URL and we'll put it in the show analysis notes. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Shepard. That was uh, that was interesting, and I think you left it with a with a great uh, with a great example. Why? Because everyone likes bacon. So um, I appreciate your time, and we'll uh, talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. That was a good talk with Shepard Shee of IBM. This podcast goes vertical, deep diving into different topics each week. If you prefer a more horizontal and structured approach to learning IoT business and its orbiting technologies, check out my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, or become a certified IoT professional by completing the ICIP training and certification program. For details, just go to www.iot-inc.com. Also go to www.iot-inc.com for an analysis of this episode, links to things that were mentioned during the episode, and very importantly, the episode's PDF transcript. Just search for the name of the episode or the guest. If you're new to this podcast, subscribe. That way you'll get every week's episode delivered straight to your device. Or, if you've been listening for a while, there are three ways you can support the show. You can leave a rating or a review on iTunes. Just go to iot-inc.com slash iTunes. It only takes one click to leave a rating, a little bit longer to leave a review. You can share it on social. I'm on LinkedIn, to a lesser extent on Twitter. And of course, you can support this show by buying my book, IoT Inc., or the ICIP Training and Certification Program. That's how I pay the bills. Next week's episode is Sexy Data Science and its analysis of IoT with Ajit Jaykar of Future Text. I hope you can join me then. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair. Thank you for listening. Till next week, may your path to IoT business be an analyzed one. You have been listening to the IoT Inc. Business Show. 